Hi everyone. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to Australia at Home's Political Geek Fest for the week where we're going to have a look at the Essential Report that was released in Guardian Australia this morning. Um, before we get started, um, just want to recognise that wherever we are around Australia, we're on Indigenous land. I'm on the Gadigal land of the Aura Nation and I pay my respects to Elders past present and emerging, as I'm sure you all will as well. Um, a re <laughs> you might all log off in a minute, but I hope not. But there's a big apology. Catherine, as you know, who's been joining me in the Geek Fest every week, is approaching the deadline for her quarterly essay and has asked to tap the mat for this week. But we are really, really lucky to have in her place um, Malcolm Farr, who is a legend of the Canberra Press Gallery and a man who has done what few people have done, which has made a transition from um, many, many years with News Limited to um, be working for Guardian Australia and working with me on the Essential Report at the moment. So we'll introduce, um, and so, so Malcolm and I will go through the, the slides in a sec. I'll sort of do the niceties with Malcolm in a minute. Before we get cracking, just the basic rules for anyone that hasn't been in these chats before. The purpose of this is just to find a place to share ideas in a civil way every day to try to keep us all together through these remarkable times. Um, if you haven't used the, the um, Zoom function before, I might be talking to you here, Malcolm, yeah. um, you, you get yourself set up on gallery and you can get a sense of the more than 100 people that are already in here. If you've got a video, turn it on. If things start lagging, they might ask you to turn it off later, but at this stage, keep it on. Use the chat. The chat, you click a bottom down towards the right and you can introduce yourself to each other to get started. And then as we go through our presentation, put questions in there and then we'll call on some of you to be part of the conversation over the course of the hour. So I think that's the further ado that we need to have no more of for now. I want to introduce Malcolm. Malcolm, um, as I say, a legend of the gallery, someone that I worked with many years ago when I was a very young reporter um, in the Murdoch press back in the 90s. He was the man that showed me the ropes. Um, and now he's um, joining us today. So Malcolm, I'm going to start off by asking you the question that we always ask our guests at Australia at Home, which is how are you going and what's changed for you in these remarkable times? Well, I feel sort of fortunate. You talked about the transition from News Corp to The Guardian, which I did primarily because it was a, a you know, I, I was in semi-retirement. It, it was a terrific opportunity to help report one of the biggest stories that we'll ever come across, uh, the coronavirus pandemic globally. But it was also a nice bit of mischief. I mean, <laughs> going from News Corp, where I worked for 36 years, uh, to the, the, the comrades uh, at The Guardian, uh, it tickled me as it did some and annoyed others. But look, they're, they're a bunch of professional and skilled journalists. Uh, I have no, uh, I have no problems uh, being on their roster. Only briefly because I'm, uh, I'm no Catherine Murphy, and she will be back soon. But it's, it's interesting being in Parliament House in these circumstances. Normally, you get, it's a vibrant place. There are people walking around and talking and being knowledgeable or being idiots. And one of the things, particularly when Parliament is sitting, that it was always good to do was simply do the block, as I call it, every floor, go around, do a lap, uh, and you bump into people and you find out all sorts of things, or you just make contact with people, MPs, staff, etc. Do it now and all you come across are tumbleweeds. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The vibrancy of Parliament House has vanished, just evaporated. Tell me, uh, is Aussies open? Aussies is open. And you know all those tables and chairs in front where, where all the lobbyists used to come and sit there all day with one cup of coffee, <laughs> much to, uh, much to uh, Dom's disgust. It's all bare floor there. You could, you could, have, a, uh, you could have ballroom dancing there and still have plenty of room. It, 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 there's nothing happening, poor old Dom, there by himself and the occasional person dropping in. And I, look, I think there's this bit of lack of vibrancy has increased not so much the lethargy, but uh, it's made it difficult for a lot of journalists who are working here because the politicians aren't 
here and a few staffers are and only you know, the, the standard admin staff are here. Uh, and even though this is an extraordinary story, it sometimes is difficult to get excited about yet another appearance by Brendan Murphy. But we, we must because it is an extremely important uh, story to cover. Um, the, that sense that Parliament feels dead, um, does that have any, you know, and there's, there's a broader analogy here that Parliament is purposely not sitting um, at the moment. Do you think that has an impact on the way decisions are being made and more importantly, the way decisions are being scrutinised? I think very much so. Um, look, e even when Parliament is having regular sittings with a full complement sitting in the uh, House of Reps during question time, the, the, the government has uh, used all, all its uh, resources and, and strategies to, um, how can we put it, uh, to diminish being held to account. Uh, there are lots of Dorothy Dixes saying how wonderful Scott Morrison in particular and the government in general is, um, uh, all sorts of to and from, but at least people were talking and at least people were uh, trying to impart information one sort or another. We're, we're losing that now, but it suits ministers and particularly the prime minister because the national cabinet has become an effective tool of national administration. I cannot see Scott Morrison wanting to relinquish that um, readily. Now, Parliament's coming back in May from May 12, but it'll be the mini parliament. Everybody will still have to be a, a meter and a half from each other in the reps in the Senate. It will have the Federation Chamber coming back, but uh, it, it's not going to be every MP and every Senator uh, sitting. Uh, it's supposed to be on uh, to discuss non-virus uh, matters so we can expect a bit of partisan politics going. But all in all, Scott Morrison is going to uh, exploit, I would suggest, going to exploit his godlike status as the man who uh, uh, has uh, suppressed the um, uh, coronavirus. And we'll see how he plays that politically. Well, on that note, we might dip into this week's report and go through a few slides. Um, I think there'll be plenty of time for people to ask you um, some questions and maybe even some Murdoch related war stories um, over the journey of the next hour. But I will do my awkward screen share here and see if we can get up into our um, presentation. Let's just see if we can do this without with the smoothness that you've all become used to. Is that on the screen? Yep. Not? Um, so we will go into slideshow. Um, the, to your point, Mal, about the Prime Minister being the saviour of the nation, um, the approval or the rating of the federal government's response to the outbreak is just going up and up. We are now hitting not quite Soviet levels, but we're into the 70s of support for the government. Um, I guess the last time we had this level of support was probably in the centre of the GFC with... Um, Kevin Rudd, and we all remember how that ended. Yeah. 70, over your 36 years, how many times have you seen support for a government in the 70s? Look, uh, nothing like that at all. And uh, um, it, it is quite remarkable. And I think it's a reflection of two things. One is that Morrison has managed um, this crisis uh, effectively in large part by not being impervious to medical and health advice from senior authorities in those areas. I mean, you, you can be rather uh, nasty and say, well, yeah, he was just doing what he's been told. But I don't think it's that simple, but certainly that's a, a large uh, element of it. Uh, uh, secondly, people are grateful that there is somebody up there who appears confident. One thing Morrison has, uh, mm -hmm. is a, uh, an ability to impart uh, a, a sense of optimism, even in the worst circumstances. Uh, even if you don't shake his hand, he'll still have a smile. Um, and I think uh, it's been a very good display of that over the past two months. But he wouldn't be uh, the hero of the coronavirus uh, if it weren't for the 
performance of, of the measures he's uh, ticked off. The suppression is working. Um, people do feel that uh, someone is looking after them and their family, uh, and that makes them uh, that that make that, that they've got to they've got to credit somebody, so mm. they credit the prime minister. One of the things that strikes me, Malcolm, is that if you compare the way he's governing to the way he ran the last election campaign, which I like to say was one man in a baseball cap versus the entire progressive infrastructure, it, it, it seems like he is now totally acting against his natural instinct of being an individual leader. And um, one of the things I'm curious about is whether you think that sticks as a long-term place he will be or if he will revert to one man in a baseball cap. Look, I, I think he will. You've got to appreciate that at the moment, he's the one out there thanking the public for being uh, obedience, <laughs> too harsh a word, but for following instructions, uh, productive instructions on how to protect themselves and the community from this, this ghastly virus. He's the one who's holding press conferences to say, what the National Cabinet has just decided. He usually does that before any of the Premiers get a chance to race out there and uh, make their own, stake their own claim to being part of the process. Well, he made that mistake once, didn't he? Yeah, well, yes, yes. But look, uh, he's, he's, even though he's, he looks very low key, uh, he is very much uh, accepting credit for what's going on. And then look, as I say, quite rightly, uh, it has been managed well uh, for a number of reasons. So it would just be, churlish to deny uh, Morrison uh, credit for that. Um, but I, I think that he will, um, he will be back to the, the baseball caps and, uh, and that uh, ever-present grin as soon as he can, because he'll need it to smile his way through uh, what's going to be a protracted economic uh, recovery. All right, look, I've already done the clip. So, um, the other interesting one I thought this week was that with that success in flattening the curve, we've actually flattened the curve of people that actually see themselves as being likely to develop the virus as well. Um, very likely is down to 5% and 21%, um, somewhat likely. That peaked at, you know, close to half. It's down to a quarter. That's going to have a psychological difference in terms of shifting the political focus from the health crisis to the economic crisis, won't it? Yes, it will. It'll give people confidence uh, that because uh, they've followed the measures necessary, um, they've not only saved their own lives and that of their family, etc., saved their health, they will be rewarded with a return of the economy. Now, uh, that expectation might be disappointed down the road, but uh, the more people think that they won't get this awful disease, the more they will think that the crisis is uh, either going away or has disappeared, and the more they will be expecting uh, to see a return to uh, normal. Uh, as I say, th those expectations might be frustrated. Where do you think the politics of that comes in? At the moment, it seems that there is a whole push, particularly from um, the, your, your previous um, organisation, News Limited, to move sooner rather than later. And I, it strikes me that there's huge amounts of political risk in going too soon in terms of owning that decision. So how do you think that's playing out for um, the Prime Minister at the moment? Look, I think there's been a strategy in conjunction with the premiers for, uh, how can I put it, uh, to boost morale, as it were, by uh, dangling, teasing objectives in front of the public. Last Friday, we saw Scott Morrison say that sport would be coming back, even though he had, he had no idea what he's talking about because he had no jurisdiction over top-level sport, such as the football codes, um, or community sport, or, or even, you know, surfing uh, uh, at, at Cronulla or in his electorate. Um, but it, it was a way of saying, uh, uh, just hold on in there because things are easing. And mm. uh, I, I think morale needed that shot. Let me suggest that 
from May, mm, May 10 or 11, you'll start to see a lot of announcements in a lot of areas of the easing. That's when um, Parliament returns on May 12 mm. for three days. And we've had indications so far from uh, a number of uh, premiers and the Prime Minister that there will be uh, further announcements in that second week of May. So it seems to be incrementally building up to that sort of crescendo or mini crescendo. Which will almost be like glorious national days of reopening. I um, mean, we've got a slide on that in just a sec. Um, I'll just show this one because this is the other side of this story, isn't it? And in a way, this is interesting. This is just coming from the regular data we ask people every week about um, their employment situation. But you can see there's been a substantial uptick in not working and looking for employment. We know that the official jobless figures are probably a little bit of a rear view mirror rather than a forward looking, but that sort of is talking towards the sort of 10%, which doesn't include the job keeper recipients who you would imagine are not all going to end up straight back into work either. Yeah, look, uh, and I think that's the primary concern for a lot of people in terms of the economy are the closure of businesses and the, the lack of employment opportunities. Look, it is a sad but undeniable fact that after uh, that jobs lost in a recession or even a near recession take a long, long time to return. Uh, and we, we've, I mean, at, at all levels, we've, we've seen debates in the last couple of days about the number of apprentices uh, who can't find uh, employment. Well, that means down the track, uh, all those apprenticeship jobs uh, won't get done, which means um, you know, the qualified tradespeople uh, won't be able to do their work properly uh, as well. That's, that's just one area. But it is a sad fact that it, it takes a long time for business to get back the confidence and the money to uh, hire staff. And if you're worried about your job now, you're going to be worried about it for quite some time to come, unfortunately. Okay, one quick more slide before we come up for air for a bit of a chat. Um, so we are now moving, I think this has shifted a little bit, but not a lot, um, but we've got almost half the population who are now willing to consider um, an easing of restriction over the next month, which sort of talks to your sort of two to three week time frame. 42% um, too soon to consider easing restrictions. I guess to kick that conversation the next step, what you know, the, the obvious risk is that people come back out of the community and there is an outbreak. What do you think about the politics around that? And what's the risk matrix that the government would be thinking through, obviously not wanting to be held to account for any further outbreaks? Yeah, well, uh, clearly the, the uh, health and, and political uh, danger is of a second wave, but we're seeing very strongly all governments um, warning the public that they, they cannot relent on certain restrictions at the moment. That, um, and a lot of people are acknowledging and accepting this. For instance, the support for the um, COVID uh, safe app. And it's, uh, whenever I say that, it, it sounds like it's a condom. Uh, but uh, <coughs> the support for that uh, in large part uh, or significant part is based on people thinking, well, if, if we adopt this, then the restrictions will be lifted uh, sooner than, than, than otherwise. So people are thinking carefully about uh, getting back to normal, whatever normal might be, but they're still very aware that precautions have to be taken because they've seen what's happened overseas and they trust the authorities who've been directing us for the past two months. Right. Um, we, were, we are going to get on to some questions on the um, dreaded app or the saviour, as some would put it, um, in a little while. But I just thought we'd just get a check of what's going on in the chat. I'll head over to our head geek, John Remington, who's been monitoring the chat. John, what are we hearing in there at the moment? Yeah, it's um, in interesting debate so far. I think the last slide you showed there, Pete, sums up the feelings in the room quite well. People supporting continuing restrictions or the people wanting to see an easing. So at the minute, this, um, there just seems to be a split in the conversation about whether or not people are for or against that. Um, and yeah, just a um, couple of 
questions and points coming up about um, whether or not vaccines will be able to, or potential vaccines will be able to do anything to um, help us in the future as well. Great. Um, Malcolm, I guess one of the challenges of making sense of what's moving so fast is, as one of the people in the chat is just like, it's Eva Cox, hello Eva, has just put forward is, what is normal anyway? And what does getting back to normal looks like? And I guess one of the values of incumbency is you've got a tendency to be able to define normal. Um, how do you see that playing out at the moment? People setting the scenes for what going back to where we were actually looked like? There are a number of people from different sectors who see this as uh, an opportunity to redefine normal, uh, to not go back to the old days, but uh, to make uh, the new days more comfortable for us in a lot of policy areas. Uh, it, the Business Council of Australia, God bless them, has, uh, has uh, reiterated its support for more uh, for greater introduction of uh, carbon free energy production uh, and and lower energy prices uh, in the post virus times so taking let's take this opportunity to move and, and you've got to remember the business council last february supported uh, the uh, net zero 2050 um, proposal for carbon emissions but there are the uh, the acos the Council of Social Services, they also want to see um, some uh, changes to welfare uh, when this is over. There are singular debates such as should the unemployment benefit, uh, the, the job start benefit stay at the current level or go back to the uh, $40 a day uh, uh, impossible to live on level. So there are all these uh, debates, all, all interesting, all strong, strongly based happening. And as I say, uh, the prospect is that normal will be redefined. It's doubtful we're going to go back to uh, you know, uh, New Year's Day 2020. That, that will have disappeared a long time ago. I know a lot of the debate in progressive politics at the moment is when to hit the button on what the future looks like and you know, at the, in the centre of a health crisis, it's still on the crisis. What's your gut on when those critical, when we move from crisis to what comes next? And what, what, what's your sense of where the timing is going to work with that? Well, look, politically, we're going to see, uh, uh, see emerge uh, a, a more partisan approach. Um, the, the Labor Party has uh, been subservient to the health and medical advice, as has the government, but the Labor Party has been supportive of, of just about everything uh, with, with some uh, marginal arguments over um, the uh, JobKeeper scheme, for example, which it pushed hard, but wasn't going to sabotage the entire scheme on the basis of that. But I think we're going to see it getting um, a, a bit more feisty. Anthony Albanese has made that clear. He's talking more often and getting out there and talking about things other uh, than the virus. There's a whole stack of, uh, of leftover issues in terms of uh, integrity and proper conduct uh, to be settled. Uh, everything from the so-called sports rorts to Angus Taylor, who's returned to prominence uh, today. Um, and I think God the return of Parliament will, will, will see more of that flavour. Mm. Hey, we've got a question here from Russell Johnson, who I know is a regular um, in the in the room so hi russell and thanks for putting a question in do you want to step up well i've, I've just been a bit disturbed about the nature of um the finger pointing that's been going on about the origin of the virus and i just wonder whether that is toned down a little lately and whether it'll return and what form it will be thank you malcolm oh uh, as far as i'm aware there's absolutely no evidence that it was this virus concocted in some uh, a, a dark state Chinese uh, laboratory dedicated to turning bats into weapons of destruction. Uh, it, it, is, it is a theory favoured by those who uh, are questing for, to blame China. And certainly China is due some blame for the way it's handled um, this whole thing. But uh, I, I think only at the fringe does anybody seriously believe that, um, that uh, this was 
uh, a, uh, a research into a weapon of mass destruction gone wrong that got loose. Uh, but I do believe that the Chinese were negligent in the way they initially handled it and do to a degree um, have responsibility for it spreading to other countries. Now, the Chinese uh, reject that and, uh, and they're getting quite cranky with Australia because some people have suggested it. But uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I think they're gonna have to wear, not so much the, the, the um, laboratory escape theory, but they're gonna have to wear the, uh, the rest of the accusation. What is the politics of Morrison going out front internationally? It feels from a distance very Trumpy and I, I just don't quite understand because I don't think he's got the same challenges Trump has. I don't, I don't understand it either. Australia, Australia has to take part in what can loosely be called globalization. We're a middle ranking power. The only way we get to sit at the table with the big kids is to join uh, all sorts of uh, uh, global organizations, whether it be APEC, the United Nations or whatever. Um, uh, Scott Morrison has begun a debate, and it'll be interesting to see where that goes after the virus, begun a debate where, as you, as you say, like Trump, to, but to a lesser degree, he's questioning the value of these uh, international alignments. Uh, and two, two, two problems come from that. One is, as I say, we don't get to sit at the same table as um, the, the big chums, uh, and we need to, whether it be the United States or, or China or Japan, uh, secondly, uh, the big fellas need us and middle ranking countries such as South Korea, ourselves and others uh, to, to leaven their own uh, 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 arrogance a bit. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to see where, the, where this goes. It might be the WHO is a special case. Uh, their um, senior, senior figures going around um, saying, uh, well, we never voted for him, referring to the director. Uh, the Ethiopian chap is considered to be a puppet of the Chinese. Uh, I, I don't think we can uh, you know, sacrifice uh, any benefit from the WHO just on the basis that we don't like the look of uh, one man. Uh, but in a broader sense, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where Morrison goes with this whole questioning of, uh, of globalised relationships. Yeah, great. Oh, we've got another question from Gillian um, Peachy. Are you there, Gillian? Uh, yes. Hello. Hi. Well, look, you know, in Queensland, we have a constant sort of struggle between tourism, in a way, and that kind of industry, and the mining industry, which is basically destroying the qualities that underpin the tourist industry. And I'm sure those towns like Mackay and Townsville will be happy that they've got the coal and the coal seam gas. Do you, do you think this is, uh, is something that will happen because there's no travel at the moment? And so I suppose tourism is kind of dead up there. Mm. Now, That's it. Look, uh, no doubt that tourism is dead and, and you, you, your heart breaks when you think of... Uh, uh, all everybody from you know the little motel to the uh, the um, beachside cafe to the larger resorts and how they're suffering. Uh, I, the thing is, you can't just flick the switch and say, "Well, let's dig a hole and sell the rocks." Um, it's just not that easy. Plus, the move uh, to um, uh, uh, you know carbon emission reduction is going to limit. Uh, the creation of, of further coal mines, and they don't produce results quickly. It takes a while for them to get going. Mm. Uh, so uh, the, the struggle will be very difficult for the economies up there, but it's easier once uh, re travel restrictions are eased or the restrictions are lifted completely. It's a lot easier to, to fly in a, a, a few people wearing their, wearing their bikinis than it is to uh, open up a new coal mine. Before we go back to a few more questions, just one more thing that's coming through on the chat, which is about today's telly front page. Um, Denise raised this. I don't, I'm not buying the telly at the moment, even though it's my alma mater. Do you know what we're talking about here, Malcolm? Or do you have any views on it? Because- No, I don't, I'm afraid. <laughs> Denise, what was the front page? Can we just call you up quickly? 
I hope that you're not doing your exercises today. I was doing my exercises. Of course Hello. you are. Hi. <laughs> you know I multitask while this is on. Yeah. Um, it's a f I've only seen it on Twitter, so I haven't seen it sort of in life, but my understanding is that it's a photo of a Chinese person who perhaps used to study here that has been, um, that perhaps works for the lab in Wuhan. Um, and it showed a photo of him and the headline was Batman. Wow. So my concern, of course, is particularly as yesterday, we saw a news item that spoke about a Chinese Australian gentleman in Piermont walking his dog and he was attacked with some racial, he was physically attacked with some racial slurs. Um, we see a front page like that of the Daily Telegraph and it's that trickle down impact into the community that's feeding these concerns. Okay. So Malcolm, at the risk of jumping on a headline none of us have actually seen except through Twitter, what are the thought <laughs> processes in News Limited do you think at the moment? You've been in that belly of the beast. How does it work? Because I know a lot of people in this room would think there is, you know, conscious conspiracies going on at all times. Does it work like that or, or how does it actually operate? How do we get those sorts of front pages? And it's not like they're rare. No, that, that sounds rather nasty. Uh, and I am uh, vaguely familiar with uh, the story. Certainly, I didn't read it all the way through, but I did read a pricey of it. Uh, and and uh, Denise is right. There, there, there's already a lot of pig ignorant racist ranting going on in the streets, attacking people of, of Asian origin for no reason whatsoever, except that uh, people feel insecure, impotent, and uh, are rather stupid. Um, look, uh, why did the telly run that? Because it thought people would be interested and would read it and talk about it. Uh, you know, in, this, in these last couple of months, um, there's a certain amount of repetition going on as to uh, covering this, uh, this, this virus and, the, and, the, and the, very, the reaction from various authorities to it. So an editor will be seeking something to, uh, to break, uh, break the monotony, if I can uh, uh, tritely describe it as such, and, and get something to uh, get a, a Hey Martha story. So that's all the, the uh, Telegraph was going for. I, I don't know about the validity of, of the, um, the argument put in the story. I, I simply don't know. But it, it, it would be very confronting and it might uh, stir uh, some insecure types uh, to take out their revenge on others. But more generally, how, how does an organisation like News Limited approach this? Do you think it's purely to maximise sales or what else is going on at an editorial level? Well, as we know, uh, news organisations want, want to sell their content so they can make money. This hasn't been an, uh, a secret. It's been going on for a long time. How they approach it is... It depends on, on uh, the outlet. And look, I, I'd suggest to you that uh, a News Corp outlet such as news.com.au, where I worked previously, um, has a younger and better informed uh, readership uh, than, say, The Australian, where many of the readers, I uh, uh, facetiously say, um, uh, are over 80, either in body or in mind, uh, and, uh, and want a more conservative view. So you see the uh, news.com.au going up very strong in support of uh, climate change action, where the Oz is still fighting this rather um, silly rear guard against it. That sort of uh, declension, I think, defines how people are approaching, various news outlets are approaching uh, th this story. Th there isn't much as people like to uh, suggest, and I think you, you'd agree with it, there isn't a, a, a blanket set of regulations. This is to, to editors every, every morning on how to cover things. The main concern of Rupert Murdoch when he is concerned about Australia is whether he's making money or not. People always used to ask me if I was told what I needed to write. And I was working back in the telly in the mid nineties under the legendary Cole Allen. And what I used to say to people was, I, no one ever told me what to write, but I knew what would get a good run. 
<laughs> and I always knew that I had to give a bit of red meat to get a good run and I could put all the stories I wanted to write up the other end. But I was a terrible journalist. I was way too biased. But I'll also say that my finest moment as a journalist was getting an exclusive with Paul Keating because I was considered compliant and um, going down and interviewing the great man. And I was such a, I was such a nervous wreck that Malcolm sat me through the interview and basically did it for me and helped me write the front page off the back. So, but I've got the, the front page of the, the Keating in, in my office and it still holds pride of place. Oh, wow. 25 years old. Yeah. Um, let's dive, that was kind of a bit of an over embarrassing reveal. Sorry, everyone. Let's <laughs> dive back into the numbers for a second half here and then we'll come up with some more questions and comments. Um, have I got it sharing? I think I do. I just need to get it moving. So the app, um, we've got 40% of people, which is a bit similar to Research Australia Institute put out yesterday, that say they would download this app, which is kind of the government's par. I, my problem with polling is that the gap between people that say they do something and actually do it is pretty wide. We've regularly polled on people that say they'll take up green energy and it's about 40% and not about 5% actually do. Um, so I'm not saying it's going to be that low, but I think there's two things in these numbers. One is that there's a bit of a, there's a, there's a two track conversation going on. People are concerned about the security of their data, but they also think this will work. And that's really the trade off that's going through on people's mind, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think you're right uh, on, on your first uh, proposition, but these are different times. And I think the seriousness of this crisis is making people, even though they are suspicious of the app, adopt it anyway. So you've got 57%, nearly 60% of people uh, reckon it's all a bit dodgy, but you will get, uh, uh, there's something, I think it said 41% of people were confident the government would look after it, but I think- I would not misuse it. It would not misuse, it. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah would, would keep it. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. yeah. But, but the, it's interesting, the 53%, uh, they say, look, this is a bit dodgy, but if it helps end the crisis, uh, I'll do it. So I, I think a lot of people are sublimating their, their natural or instinctive concerns and, and uh, going for, the, for uh, the better good. What do you think the, the politics of announcing it, A, not with the Prime Minister and not with Stuart Robert, which, with Greg Hunt, who seems to be the guy that's at least, you know, delivering the health win, surrounded with Nurses Union, AMA, CMOs. It, it, it was the full-on sell job, wasn't it? Well, when this first dropped uh, a couple of weeks ago, when, uh, when the Prime Minister mentioned it uh, without outlining any detail uh, or providing any detail. I tried to find out who was in charge. So I went to uh, Josh Frydenberg and he said, Christian Porter, the Attorney General be, would be sorting it out. Um, no, that's, no, yes, he did say that. Then Paul Fletcher, the Communications Minister also said, uh, Christian Porter. Uh, and then someone said, no, it's Greg Hunt. I went to Greg Hunt's office and he said, no, it's the Minister for Government Services, Stuart Robert. So it seemed to be part the parcel uh, for an afternoon as I, as I went around trying to find these uh, who was responsible for it, it ended up Stuart Robert was. And he's barely been seen since. And I, I do suggest that's because uh, his personal record is not one conducive to confidence in the implementation of this scheme. Uh, and whatever you think about uh, Greg Hunt, uh, Minister Hunt is probably uh, a, a more solid uh, 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 ministerial presence to, to launch something this controversial. Now, the government's been clear that it's not going to compel use of the app, but are you hearing anything about tying any of these glorious um, loosenings of society to hitting particular numbers? And how do you think that will play out? I'm not sure. The Prime Minister said 40% take up, and by and large, people are saying, well, that's much too low. Uh, it's going to be have to be a lot higher than that. When Parliament returns, we're going to see legislation. At the moment, the government is suggesting that it will be secure and there are regulations that will enforce this. Well, yeah, but there will also need legislation. I mean, think of the prospect of a court 
uh, wanting to subpoena your contacts, uh, and maybe a family court matter or something. They want to know not so much you or, or somebody who they've been near. You're going to need legislation to uh, be able to tell a, a court to get nicked. So the story isn't complete. The government, to a degree, has rushed into this. Uh, and it's going to be a uh, continuous process before it, it, it satisfies everybody about the security. And even then, I would suggest uh, there will be a lot of, uh, uh, quite a significant number of holdouts. Yeah. And for anyone that's interested in the broader tech issues, we're going to be hosting Claire O'Neill on Thursday, who's Labor's um, tech lead at the moment, um, and a couple of um, the digital rights guys to sort of nut this out in a bit more detail. I'll just go through a couple more slides before we come back up for some questions. We asked one about tax reform. Um, there's one very popular proposition, which I don't know if it's being floated by the government or not, Malcolm, but the idea that companies that are registered in offshore tax havens may not be eligible for government support. Um, is that anything that anyone's contemplating or is this pub policy? Look, I, I saw um, a brief mention to this, this sort of scheme. I think it was in, in the Dutch government or the Swedish government or something like that, not the Australian government. Um, so I, I don't know where that came from here in Australia, if it did, but I do know that, that it's been proposed or enacted, might have been Norway, um, in, in somewhere in Europe. Sorry to be so vague on that. Uh, it, I, I was surprised when I, when I saw it as, as one of the options. I but think I might have just picked it up in the press clips at some stage last week and said, hmm, that's a good idea. <laughs> yes, probably the same clip I read. Yeah. Um, but but it, it certainly attracted a lot of attention, doesn't it? Hasn't it? And, and it conforms with a view pre-virus that there are a lot of companies who are, who are avoiding tax, uh, but yet claiming all the uh, advantages of a country uh, with a, uh, a tax system that pays for nice roads and parks and mm. uh, et cetera. And um, I, I think the public is getting uh, rather sick of that and they'd like to see it changed. Anyone that thinks this might reopen the um, a groundswell for negative gearing, franking credits or inheritance tax is probably going to be a little bit more sanguine from these results. Yeah, indeed. isn't that interesting? It's It's not as if... The last election was a, uh, a, a freak. Punters don't like these taxes at all. And uh, um, you know, there wasn't a death tax uh, offered by Labor at the last election, but the other taxes were, were dressed up mm. as a death tax, quite falsely. Um, uh, but quite clearly, uh, voters um, uh, want other options. Mm. A um, couple more slides before we, we, we round this out. Um, we asked about different sectors of the economy um, and whether we think they're going to put the public interest against their own. Um, interestingly, at the bottom of the list at the moment, and the way we read this, might even need to get John to help me read this in a sec, but the, um, the light blue, the lighter the blue, the nicer we think they are, the darker the blue, the more we think they're self-interested. Um, cruise ships and banks and insurance companies, we think it's sort of probably doing it for themselves. Um, aged care facilities, which obviously have been in the, in the ringer ahead of this, come out with um, a much cleaner bill of health than one may have imagined um, six months ago. Hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, that all makes sense. Um, I have a 93 year old mother in an aged care home on the Gold Coast, and they're doing all sorts of things like setting up uh, Skype contacts uh, between her and me. They're going to great lengths to look after her and the other residents there. There have been some cases uh, around Sydney where there have been infections and sadly there have been deaths, and there was another report of that today. But I think a lot of people, particularly if they have relatives uh, in these homes, are very appreciative of, what, of how they've been looked after. Yeah. And the last one before we come out, this is just a bit of a benchmark we've been running, which sort of speaks to government doing a good job. 68% say the response is about right. And if you look at where that was at the start, it's almost a doubling. Um, again, team government is doing well for Team Australia at the moment. Yeah, I mean, uh, as we say, yeah. Um, Scott Morrison's having a good pandemic. Uh, and it's, a re it's remarkable how much trust 
has uh, been given to government in the broad, not necessarily the Prime Minister, um, compared to four or five months ago when uh, uh, you know, no one would volunteer that, uh, that they trusted any of the political institutions, including uh, political journalism, suddenly things have changed uh, in this virus and it's a fascinating transition. Yeah. John, anything, any bright ideas for next week's report coming through from our friends in the gallery? Um, no, I think it's been pretty much focused on the conversations you and Malcolm have been having. Uh, Denmark and Poland have been suggested as the European countries you were thinking about. And yes, your interpretation of um, that shot was spot on, so nothing to add there from me. All right, a couple of app questions. First, Alexander Lau had a great question before we went into this. Are you there, Alexander? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so my question was just, um, there was an article in the Sydney Morning, Sydney Morning Herald um, saying that despite our distrust of the federal government or governments um, and political class, that when it comes to the social good, um, we are generally very compliant, such as the COVID Safe app. Do you agree, disagree, thoughts? I, I, th I think we are. And, and it, it, it's not as if we're, we're you know, obedient all the time, despite what we might think. Uh, I think there's been a definite and mature decision by most Australians uh, to take the precautions seriously because they see the benefit of them and they trust the people who are recommending them. Uh, and yet we're not all Donald Trumps. A lot of us uh, think very seriously about these things and, uh, and uh, take up and weigh measures and take them up according to uh, our, our uh, informed evaluation. And I think Australia's responded very well in that direction. Um, and also a question, but I'm also going to throw it back on him, but John Robertson had a question for both of us. Malcolm, are you there, Robbo? Yeah, I am, Pete. I'm very intrigued um, to know whether you're going to download it and whether Malcolm is, because um, my view with this thing at the moment is I want to see every politician in the country download it before I'm going to think about doing it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, it's one might think it's dangerous for a journalist to do it because, uh, you know, you don't want people to know with whom you've had contacts uh, 15 minutes or, or whatever. Well, especially given what we've seen happen with the AFP raids. That, that's right. Yes. Well, yeah, look, I think we're, I don't think we're going to have any police going through my underwear drawer, <laughs> but uh, the, the sad thing is that, um, if they did get my data, they would find that uh, I've been in contact uh, with two blokes who work in my office and uh, my wife, and that's about it. So it's a very sad story from my my data, I'm afraid. Yeah, look, and, we, and as I say, we're going to have a broader discussion on this. Mike, I, my, my line at the moment, Robbo, is I want to be in the position where I would, and that will require a little bit more um, of a safety net around how it works because if you think about it this is incredible technology that is being used for an incredible time but the idea that we have got technology that would allow us to be tracked and our interactions monitored you know you think about how else it could be used for good and ill it could be used to enforce avos well, we might be, be very good to things for the future indeed so mm -hmm. i just think we really need to take this moment to think it through and my my positive on this is actually that if we use this moment to get the parameters right, we might change the way that we um, embrace new technology. Because I, I do think it's this moment where the government actually needs the public on board if they think this is essential for opening up the economy. So it's not just do this for us. It's a two-way conversation that will be going on. And my gut is that the, the numbers won't be quite what they want and they're going to have to ring round on this a couple of times before they get the social license they're looking for. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, there was a really good question on um, framing um, from Lillian Spencer. I don't know if you're happy to have a chat, Lily. Yeah, sure. Um, hi. Hi. I just was curious about your thoughts of, of, can we start to explore some of the framing and language that we use to describe where we want to go from here? So we know that recovery kind of implies the sort of return to some pre-existent thing that was good. It also kind of frames the economy in this very biological way if we're thinking about it in economic terms. So people have talked about bounce back better or bounce forward, which I think is a little awkward. What are your guys' thoughts on how do we start to talk 
about this idea. Some say the pandemic is a portal that we can get through this on the other side to create something far better than perhaps what we were limited by before. Uh, one minor point, every time somebody refers to the other side, I keep, I think they're thinking about uh, life after death. Because, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a common use I've heard of. The bridge over the river sticks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Rowing away. Um, look, uh, as I said before, I, I, I think the impact of this is going to be so great that there's going to have to be a different way of doing a lot of things afterwards. A, because we have to, and B, because we've come across some pretty good ideas, or they have been forced on us um, over the past uh, two or three months. And one of them uh, are these, uh, as a Zoom master, you, you, will, you will do this more often. Um, it's interesting, this, uh, the, the, the tracing app, a lot of people, a lot of journalists won't be going down to meet their contacts in the, in the car park uh, at 10 o'clock at night they'll simply be uh, on WhatsApp or something like that. And uh, so many meetings, as Scott Morrison says, there's been so much uh, interaction and engagement without people leaving uh, their host city on this. Um, I think things like that will stay in place. But it's broader than that, broader than the adoption of technology. Uh, th there are some, um, some areas such as in IR, I mean, uh, uh, John might comment, but th th there are some things that have been removed, uh, 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 just uh, just streamlining regulations during this period. Uh, they probably won't come back. There have been some things like uh, not requiring an auditor to um, uh, attend a, uh, a company general meeting because, you know, auditors and whatever can't fly around the place. Why not have AGMs uh, online? So punters can, you know, small shareholders can take part but not have to travel to Perth or Sydney or whatever. Ideas like that will uh, uh, will be examined much more closely than they might have before this. Lily, one of the um, nice ideas I've heard being floated around is the concept of get better together. Um, and where that leads is actually, I think, a really interesting space, which is there's going to be a whole lot of decisions made, but the other thing I think we've learnt from this process is that there are better ways of making decisions. The, the, the reality is that Australia's done well because there has been the federal states working together. There's been civil society with real engagement into decision making. There's been expert led policy and there's been an engaged citizenry. Wouldn't it be great if the, the next big question wasn't just what's the tax system going to look like or how much is new stuff, but how do we actually make those decisions? So that's definitely going to be a conversation that we're going to be developing out through Australia at home over the coming weeks. Um, I think we've got time for one more question before we um, call stumps. So I'm just going to my list. Um, I would go back to the earlier statements. Is Anthony still there? Anthony Smith? Because it's a really good one to round out the, the, the discussion, I think. I am. I'm just... Um, I'm just you're, in a, uh, you're in a forest. No. <laughs> not quite. Here I am. Hey, um, so um, the anti-China uh, messaging that's coming out strikes me as just being dog whistling. When people are accused of being racist about it, they say, oh, it's definitely not racist. What's the most effective way to counter the mm. dog whistling? Look, and we did do a session with um, Jason Lee a few weeks ago on the whole anti-China. I think it's, I never know if, like, for instance, I don't think there's much to be gained by putting that in a question in the poll to find that 45% of Australians blame Chinese because I just think it reinforces it. I know when we've checked Muslim sentiment in the past, it comes out with those sorts of figures. So... I think it's, you know, and I, I know that the, the argument Jason was making that the, the trick is to still, to not, to not make that story bigger, but to focus on the really important connections Australia is going to have to maintain with China to come out the other end of the recovery and to sort of do that whole positive frame on it. Now, um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Malcolm, but it just seems to me that if we get stuck in who's to blame, we're not going to go very far at all. Look, I think the, the question was more about street level mm. racist rants and how do you combat that? You're right that uh, people get encouraged into those positions from 
uh, so-called serious comment, but I don't know what you do except um, call out the racists and tell them to jam it themselves. I mean... Uh, Take out your iPhone and film it. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it, it, it sounds very, very basic and very crude, but the more these people operate uh, without uh, you know, compunction and, uh, and penalty, uh, the more they're going to do it. Yeah. Hey, um, we might wind it up there. I want to thank everyone for sharing their time with us today. I want to particularly thank Malcolm for being the font of wisdom from the Hill. And um, it's been great having you um, along for the ride, Malcolm. Thanks to John, our resident geek, for keeping things running. Upcoming events. Tomorrow, we're talking about American politics with Dan Pfeiffer, who runs the world's most successful political podcast, Pod Save America. So he's coming from the States. Um, Thursday, as I said, we've got Claire O'Neill talking about all things technology and a special event that I hope you'll be at, Robbo, on Friday at six o'clock. We are jointly hosting Unions New South Wales May Day Toast. We've got Thomas Keneally, we've got Sharon Burrow, we've got Sally McManus, but I've got Billy Bragg to come in from London to sing Solidarity Forever mm -hmm. that everyone's going to sing together at the end. So if you're up for that, register for the May Day Toast and join Robbo and me on Friday. Um, thanks, everybody. Until next time, um, stay home, stay safe, stay connected. And, um, yeah, thanks for The Guardian for their support and onwards and upwards. Cheers, everyone. Oh.